So tonight we really have two kind of big goals. One is that we want to provide good information um, to city residents and the public so that they understand how the capital budget is put together. The other though is that we want input from city residents on what to include in the 2021 capital budget. We have these meetings every year, maybe you've attended in years past. Normally we do two kind of big citywide meetings covering the entire budget. Um, we move the meetings around for geographic diversity. We normally use a really great format called deliberative democracy that was really pioneered by Robert Cavalier at Carnegie Mellon that fosters small group discussions around three really important questions. Also that has a Q and A um, question and answer session. And it's a great opportunity for neighbors to learn about each other's experience. Um, also, we provide childcare, we provide food. I personally miss the pierogies. Um, but this year with COVID-19, we needed to kind of switch things up. So we're doing three meetings on different portions of the budget. The good news is we're able to do kind of a deeper dive in, into some of the subjects people really care about. Um, we're also streaming live on YouTube, hello to the internet. Um, and with all this, I really wanna say thank you to the Office of Community Affairs, the Department of Innovation and Performance, and tonight's interpreters, Megan Aiken and Logan Showalter. Again, those two meeting notes to help with accessibility for those interpreters is to mute your audio and turn off your video. Um, also, an accessibility issue. If you hear any acronyms you don't understand, please call me on it. Feel free to type, to type something into the chat. We'll be sure to clarify. My, my New Year's resolution genuinely is to use less acronyms. Um, at this time, I just wanted to do a quick accessibility check to see if anybody's facing any challenges that we can help with. All right. So tonight we're gonna do a short overview um, of the capital budget process. I promise there's not a lot of numbers and there's less than 10 slides. We're also going to have some really great discussions from Ross Chapman with City Parks, who's gonna talk to us about how City Parks um, uses different spaces and programs the infrastructure. We're gonna to talk to Chris Hornstein about the Department of Public Works, how they develop projects um, get into some inventory numbers for the assets that we have that you may be using every single day, and also how DPW prioritizes projects for new proposals. And we're going to close out with Kara Smith from City Planning who's going to talk to us about comprehensive planning for our recreation assets, and also City Planning's participation in park master planning projects like Southside Park or Sheridan. One important thing to keep in mind is um, we really do want your input. We're gonna use it in a few different ways. One is that um, the results that you give us from an online survey are gonna be published in the capital budget. We also make sure to share those results with the departments and with council offices. That does a couple things. One, it allows them to generate their own project ideas. We've had instances where the public has provided an idea through these very forms that turned into a capital budget proposal. Also, it, it demonstrates public support for projects. So when council offices are deliberating, what to include in the budget, they have that record of what the public wants. Additionally, your questions via expert panel um, are gonna be recorded. All the comments, again, from the chat function are gonna be recorded and shared with department leadership, the administration, the council offices. Um, and of course, everything's gonna be shared on YouTube as well. There's actually two budgets for the city of Pittsburgh um, that come out of our office. One is the operating budget that covers a lot of the kind of day-to-day -day expenses, especially around personnel. So things like salaries, um, employee health care, office supplies, the, the gas and water bills for all of our facilities. Tonight, though, we're going to be talking about the capital budget, which is more of our physical infrastructure. It's the built environment. It's the streets and sidewalks, parks, pools, playgrounds, bridges, ball fields, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're ever on our website, they have two different covers. If you're looking for the capital one, ours is the one with the lightning on the right hand side. The capital budget itself, um, it's important to keep in mind that, that the larger projects in the capital budget can, can take millions of dollars to complete, sometimes multiple years, multiple phases. So for each um, project type, we, we do what's called a CIP or a capital improvement plan. Um, the budget itself is really a series of these kind of six year plans stacked on top of each other. It's a, a way for us to be responsible, to understand the commitments that we're making today, how they impact our future, and allows us to plan for things um, like our bond issuances or other, other spending plans that we wanna do. The process itself um, kicked off just a little bit ago. In April, the mayor releases a list of their um, budget priorities. We're gonna talk about those. You're gonna have a, a chance to comment on them in the survey itself. 
in May, our office, the Office of Management and Budget, issues a request for proposals from the departments, from the council offices, and from um, a few nonprofits who've worked with us in the past on capital projects, like Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. In um, June, we have these public meetings. We, we, we do outreach to get, get their, gather feedback from the public. And then all the proposals are due July 1st. In July and August, our office spends a lot of time meeting with department leadership and project managers to ask questions about the proposals that were submitted, get some additional context on maybe the timeline or the feasibility of the project. And then the Capital Program Facilitation Committee um, scores all of the projects. The Capital Program Facilitation Committee is made up of members of the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, our office, the City Council Budget Office, the Controller's Office, and also directors from departments that carry out capital projects like the Department of Public Works, uh, Mobility and Infrastructure, and City Planning. The Mayor really has a, a pretty expansive list of priorities this year. They're really meant to inspire proposal ideas from department leadership. Department leadership and project managers should really be asking when they're drafting the proposals, how does this proposal fit into the mayor's priorities? They're really the guiding values for the capital budget process. Um, and they're, they're a great way for us to understand how what we're doing fits into the larger vision for the city. Again, you'll have a chance to read all of these in more detail um, and to comment on them in the survey. This is um, a screen capture from the capital budget proposal form for 2021. As you can see, we ask for detailed financial information, including that kind of six year capital improvement plan. Um, that allows us to understand, again, what our commitments are gonna be for future phases of projects. We also ask questions um, to, to get the project managers and department leadership thinking in their own words about why this project is so important. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight is that we actually do ask about the operating budget impact, even though it's not our budget, we still want to understand that if we're building a brand new pool, what is the staffing need for that? And what, what would that do to the capital budget? Um, on the other end of the other side of the coin, there's opportunities to actually save money in the operating budget with capital projects. We've had some big kind of software, in, 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 ugh, software interventions, um, software projects, especially with our Department of Finance that we're able to automate some processes and save us a lot of time and money. We also ask the departments to comment on these um, kind of eight factors. These are the actual scoring criteria that the Capital Program Facilitation Committee um, scores against. Out of that whole committee, there's a subset that does the scoring. Um, there's five of us. There's two people from our office, the, off the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget. There's two people from the City Council Budget Office who score projects. And then the fifth is a member of the Controller's Office staff. We score the proposals that we receive against the criteria that you can see on the screen right now. Uh, we sort them from highest to lowest. We apply that year's funding constraints, which is how much money we have to spend. And then we kind of come up with each team member's uh, proposed budget. The projects are ranked, the mayor and city council receive those rankings. And then that's the kind of building blocks for the development of the capital budget. I do want to acknowledge some feedback and, and rightful concern that we've gotten um, in previous meetings, the two other meetings we had, we had one last week for mobility transportation projects. We had a great meeting on Monday about community projects and there are a lot of really great questions related specifically to this, the public safety training facility project. You may have seen it in the 2019 or 2020 budget. Um, it's important to note that no final decisions have been made on this project specifically. There's gonna be a number of opportunities to, to comment further on it in the future when things like the contracts for the work are gonna go in front of council. Also, it's important to note that the money that's been allocated so far was approved by council through the same kind of public process we have for any budget item. Um, most of the money is still unspent and the, the money that's currently budgeted is really intended for planning of the historic assets that are currently on the site. This, this project would go onto the VA site um, on Washington Boulevard, which was formerly owned by the federal government. So um, most of the money is to, is to really review the assets that are there and to do some planning around historic preservation. Um, again, if you have any comments about this project specifically, feel free to include those in the chat. All the comments from this meeting will be shared with council, mayor off mayoral office um, and department leadership. So they have a record of the public's view whenever these kind of items come up for, for discussion with council. I think it's also a good project to highlight because even though we have the six year um, capital improvement plans, we're only really committing in the years that the, the funds are legislated. So only the 2020 money is actually committed. 
The outer year funds that are on, on the screen are meant as a plan so that we can be responsible and know kind of how future phases of other big projects would fit in with this one. Um, but none of this money has been guaranteed. The only way it could be guaranteed is either through um, a future year capital budget allocation or through a contract. And both of those things go in front of council uh, for their approval. And there's always a public comment section um, with any council hearing as well. So there's, there's further opportunities to talk about this project specifically. Um, tonight, though, we wanted to get into our recreation projects. So at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Ross Chapman. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Chris, if you wouldn't mind to start sharing yours. I actually met Ross for the first time waiting um, in line at the starting gate at, what is the, what's the race in the Squirrel race. Hill? The Great Race. The great Race, thank you. Yeah, we both had city employee t-shirts on. Um, <laughs> and Ross spotted me and said, do you work with Reader Price? So it was a <laughs> great way to meet Ross, I don't know, four years ago? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. Um, um, so, <clears throat> Chris, are you going to lead in with anything, or do you want me to just start and give an overview based on um, our department, the par Department of Parks and Recreation? Um, I think, Ross, I think you can go ahead and um, start and just ask me to advance the slides. You're welcome to advance, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Just a, a thanks to, again, the, the mayor's office and all the departments that work really hard to put this together, um, these capital meetings. I've done them in the past in a live forum. This is, as David indicated, <clears throat> so a little unusual this year, uh, as is everything. We're in, in quite an unusual, unprecedented time. Um, so it's great we can facilitate this, but it wouldn't be possible without the, without the other departments that, that kind of put this together. So. Um, you might wonder how parks and recreation fits into capital budget processes. The, our department doesn't really have capital monies as it relates to brick and mortar uh, infrastructure improvements and those projects that David mentioned earlier. Um, there's, a, there's kind of a, an interesting piece of the capital funding um, piece that, that, we, that we are a recipient of funds, uh, community de development block grant funds, which help provide um, programs for our seniors. It's a big part of our senior program. I think there's a slide coming up here soon. But so there are some monies that at times um, trickle in that don't go to an infrastructure project, um, you know, physical asset development project, but they are geared towards programs and people. And for our department, having 13 senior centers, it supports the programs and the staff that uh, facilitate the programs for the seniors. So I just wanted to make mention of that because a lot of people just don't make that association. And it's important that we get that money. It's, it, it's critical. Uh, whenever you're ready, Chris. Thanks. Just a quick slide. I'm not going to read it, but those are, these are some of the, our, our main program areas of focus. Um, our interface with the Department of Public Works and Chris's team is really critical because the Facilities Bureau kind of houses these capital monies largely. So for all the work that we might want to do or uh, interest that we have or deferred maintenance that we need to tackle for our senior centers, healthy active living centers, uh, our recreation centers, we have 10 of those. Uh, any of the aquatics facilities, there's a bunch, you know, 18 swimming pools, outdoors and so forth and so on. We have to interface directly with not only the budget office, the mayor's office, but we work intimately with uh, the Department of Public Works, the uh, Bureau of Facilities and Chris's team. So uh, my team kind of works with a, a group of individuals, architects and project leaders in uh, the, the Public Works Department to facil facilitate a lot of the work that Chris will end up talking about uh, a little later in the presentation. So we're, we, we kind of share a, a, a kind of a mutual, um, there's a connective tissue, I should say, between what it is that we feel like we, we need to do uh, based on public input, uh, community process, and in many instances, if it's not just uh, dealing with a deferred maintenance issue, uh, but our, we have a dependency on public works, and it's nice that we have a, a good kind of unsiloed working relationship because we've been able to do a heck of a lot of stuff over the last few years. Thanks, Chris. Uh, just a slide as to what we're responsible for. Uh, the, the name Parks and Recreation, it, it's a, 
it's, I guess it's misleading in some ways for those that think that uh, our department um, would uh, manage things like trails and um, green spaces, um, those things that are actually connected to parks. We do a little less of that, a lot of less of that actually, a lot less of that. Uh, we're kind of more, the mayor likes to say, people in programs. So we can facilitate and we do work in, in parks and green spaces, uh, but typically it's in and around a program or a service that we're delivering. So uh, on the screen now is just a list of <clears throat> some of the assets, physical assets. And in total, I think during the summer months, during a normal non-COVID-19 summer, we would probably have about 50 plus active facilities with people in them, not including parks and green spaces. So 400 to 500 staff people, swimming pools and the whole bit, all of those dependencies that I mentioned before with public works and the Bureau of Facilities, they have to turn stuff on, make sure it's working for us. Um, all of those things. So we are responsible for a lot of the, the programming that is delivered in and around parks, but less so for park maintenance and those types of items. Next. Yeah, this is always an interesting slide. When, when the city conducts um, a spring and a fall Civic Leadership Academy class for interested city residents to sign up to learn more about city departments and this is kind of pulled from a presentation that we've been delivering for a few years. But uh, again, to clarify some of the stuff that the Department of Parks and Recreation slash City Parks isn't responsible for, it's those things that you see on the screen with the exception of uh, the Shenley Ice Rink, which has recently kind of returned to at least the programmatic oversight of the Shenley Ice Rink and its functions. Uh, of course, the Public Works Bureau, uh, Facilities Bureau still maintains the facility as it does all the facilities um, that we have people in. So you can see a, a list of things there that, are, that have been associated with the Department of Parks and Recreation, but they're, they're actually managed by different departments. Though the interface between um, our department and these departments that are on the screen that you're seeing now, it, it's pretty close. So there's a lot of shared resources, a lot of shared information, and they're kind of uh, our partners in, in pretty much everything that we attempt to deliver and or program. Thanks, Chris. With that, I think this is when you're queued in, sir. Yes, thank you, Director Chapman. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and for your interest in this process. I think it's fantastic when people express great interest in uh, their local government to see what is happening. Uh, thank you again too for the Office of Management and Budget and for um, the Department of Innovation and Performance for providing this platform so we can uh, you know, have some engagement with the community, which we always very much appreciate. So before I kind of get into the basics of what we think about in public works about uh, capital projects, I just want to point out, and since Ross was so keenly kind to, to point out roles and responsibilities. As the Assistant Director of Public Works and the Bureau of Facilities, it's my staff and myself's responsibility to kind of execute all of our um, capital construction projects throughout the city if it relates to a building or to a park, much like um, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure is kind of that interface for our city streets. Um, the Department of Public Works is that interface for our buildings and our parks. Um, when we think about capital projects, we really kind of lump them into two broad categories. I classify them as kind of a sustainment project. This is kind of very similar to what you might think of. If you're, if you're a property owner, this would be like um, replacing a roof on your home or um, possibly getting a new boiler or a new air conditioner. Uh, you know, these services, they generally require a typical amount of, of input um, from my project management staff and my architects and engineers that we have on, the city has on staff. Um, the other type of project that we will perform is what I like to call a transformation project. So this is exactly like it sounds. This is, we're gonna take something and we're going to make it different and better than it was before the transformation. So sometimes this means adding, um, systems such as air conditioning. Sometimes we're talking about improving um, improving the asset, what it might be in its service performance. 
And you know, generally these require a high level of design and engineering and a little bit more work and forethought um, as to how we do and what we and what we do. Um, both of these types of projects require close coordination with, with all of our departments um, because you know everybody that works for the city at some point in time or another steps foot in the building. So we interface not just with um, Ross and his team in the Department of Parks and Recreation, but we also interface with um, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, also the Department of Public Safety, the Bureau of Fire, the Bureau of Police, Emergency Management Services, and kind of a whole host of other pieces. And that also would include, you know, the, um, any work that we would coordinate between ourselves and the Department of City Planning. Um, so it's very much a team effort um, at the city, as Ross alluded to. Um, it, the, who's a part of that team kind of depends on what the asset is, but for this conversation, um, you know, it does really require, you know, pretty much a seamless work between the two of us in terms of division of labor and roles and responsibility. Um, when I talk about a sustainment project, you know, these are very simple. So basically we will develop a scope of work um, and we will develop the scope of work either through community input or through our own observation or at the suggestion of a department. Um, we will put this through the capital budget process that we are in now. Um, you know, the council would then, you know, approve that budget, and um, we would go through a very brief um, design or procurement step where we figure out how we're going to deliver this construction service, and then we would begin construction. So typically, that capital budgeting process, from the time we have a scope of work to the time we get on the budget approval, is generally three to six months. Um, and depending on the type of construction for a sustainment activity, that could be anywhere from nine to 18 months, depending on the type of work that we perform. For a transformation project, it's much longer. Um, so first, we take a little bit longer kind of period of time to go over our plan and our scope. This may include interfacing with the departments, with various departments about what needs to happen. We will submit a formal request via the capital budget process and the council will approve that process. From there, we typically will first, if we know we need to hire architects and engineers to design this construction project for us, um, we will go find those, those firms and those teams and um, we will have them develop the project to a, what we would call construction documents. Um, we would resubmit a new budget request for construction um, at which we would ask for council's approval on that and then we would begin construction. This process typically takes from the time that we identify the opportunity till we have a constructed element at least three years, and in some cases as we'll find out it will take much longer depending on you know, the scope of transformation that we're talking. Um, we deliver capital projects in two different ways. We deliver them with what I would call single phase, that is exactly as it sounds. We do all the construction in one single project, this kind of requires us to fund the entire budget at one time. Um, so we have to be you know, thoughtful um, with the capital process and what people are asking for. Um, whenever the asset is under construction, it's typically not usable. So a really good examples of this would be um, you know, recent projects at the Shenley Ice Rink and at Whiteman Park. Another way that we deliver projects for citizens is what we call multi-phase. And so, we would identify the entire scope of work up front as multiple deliverables or multiple construction projects that we would then space out over several years. Um, this requires us to be a little bit more strategic about how we um, budget for those projects to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of funds at the correct time. Um, but this also gives us some flexibility in that the facility can remain operational during a portion of the construction. So some examples of this would be um, Southside Market House work, um, work at McGee, McGee Rec and Greenfield, and um, Paulson Spray Farm. Um, right now, I want to talk a little bit about our assets. So, you know, there are 166 city parks, uh, approximately 3,600 acres of those. We have numerous miles of trails, and there's just a lot of features um, with the parks themselves. And then we're going to take a little bit of a dive, a deeper dive into, into what all that entails. Um, we have numerous ball fields and courts. We have over 100 ball fields, and they, and they vary from 
um, you know, your typical baseball or softball diamond to rectangular fields that folks play soccer or football on. I mean, we have a few combination fields as well. We have over 200 courts. Um, most of these are basketball and tennis, but we do have some street hockey and some deck hockey courts, as well as a couple um, bocce and lawn bowling. Uh, there are a few pickleball courts as well. Pickleball is one of those, those uh, recreational activities that we're starting to slowly see um, some uptick on. So in terms of how these assets are aligned, um, we too try to be responsive to um, public requests for um, you know, changing those assets slightly to get a more greater variety of uh, recreational activities. Um, we have 119 playgrounds um, and with numerous play areas. This is a, you know, we have an ongoing program that, that replaces our outdated um, assets. We take this very seriously. We're really concerned about um, the safety of children in our play areas. We have a pretty robust program, we think, with the Capital Budget Office to, to kind of replace those and address those as needed. Um, Ross, I was hoping I could, have, I could have you speak a little bit about um, some of our swimming pools and spray parks. Uh, certainly, Chris. Yeah, <clears throat> I think I kind of made quick mention of the number of aquatics assets that the city has that um, are seasonally programmed, really. Uh, we have the very unique Oliver Bathhouse in the south side. It's the only indoor swimming pool that the city maintains and operates. Um, it's open kind of in, the, in those cooler months, usually from early September until May. Uh, it closes during the summertime when, when the outdoor pools uh, open up. Out, 18 outdoor swimming pools. It's a lot of pools. Um, they usually, in a normal season, we would have opened them probably, I think we'd be opening them this coming Monday. Usually it follows right after the school year ends, the public schools, because we're typically heavily dependent upon um, um, students, young folks, to serve as lifeguards. Uh, the aquatics team, the supervisor of the aquatics program has been with the city for quite some time. She probably wouldn't want me to, to say how long, but she's extremely experienced and we take the, the training and the certification quite seriously. This year, unfortunately, given COVID-19, there's just no real safe way to operate pools. Our pool decks are kind of small, social distancing uh, in and around a pool would be difficult, restrooms, locker rooms. So uh, I think we could see this coming. A lot of other municipalities have made the same decision uh, locally and in other states as well. Um, but this, th these assets, in addition to the eight spray parks, our newest one was brought online last year, just down the street from the Paulson Recreation Center, um, the Paulson Spray Park and Playground. Um, spray parks will be open this year, beginning uh, next, this coming Monday, June 15th. Um, so we, we're hoping that we can facilitate those safely. We're going to do our best. But these assets in particular, again, require us to interface with uh, the Facilities Bureau and Chris's team uh, quite intimately because they have needs. The, you know, there's, there's a lot to maintain uh, these, these spaces uh, for three months out of the year. So there's, there's quite a bit of uh, work that has to happen, not only from a personnel and programmatic standpoint, which usually our team starts in February, really February, March for recruitment, um, but it goes right up until opening because there's a lot to getting these places up and running and they're not, they're not inexpensive to maintain and operate. So um, uh, just a quick thanks to Chris for all the work that they do and have done to kind of just get us ready with our eight spray parks uh, for this coming Monday. Uh, oh, made quick mention of this as well, 10 recreation centers. Um, a lot of this information you can find uh, on our website, all of it, you really can. You can find the exact locations for each senior center or healthy active living centers. You can find the 10 rec centers, the locations as well. You can learn more about our food programs, after school food programs, some of those, some of that stuff that was on those uh, first few slides. I won't get too deep into that, but we also have a pretty good social media presence. We, we have a, a, really, a really good um, kind of social media expert and she's been able to kind of uh, amplify 
be well beyond um, the great website that the innovation and performance team kind of puts together for the whole of the city. And so we push a lot of stuff out there that we're doing relative to all of our programs um, via Facebook and, and to some extent Twitter. So if you're not following City Parks, you might want to try because you'll be updated with, with new offerings, new programs, new services, those kinds of things. On this slide again makes mention of the uh, Healthy Active Living Centers in conjunction with the uh, CDBG money, the $750,000 that we've been receiving for the last few years. Uh, we are supported by the Allegheny County Area Agency on Aging. So they make it possible for us to facilitate the program. Uh, we get just a little bit more money than we, we do in the federal dollars that you see on the screen here to operate the program. It's, it's run pretty lean, um, but we have an active membership and I, I, I probably shouldn't throw this out there because I'm not real sure, but I think we provided uh, oh, 70 some thousand meals to seniors, uh, lunches that, that they are, uh, free lunches to our senior members uh, last year. Um, so we, we, we touch a lot of um, folks in a lot of communities in a lot of ways. And this summer is quite unusual because right now our recreation and senior centers are still closed for, for the obvious reasons, um, especially for the, for the senior population. Um, so we're not sure when they're gonna come back online, but we have activated folks to help out with the food, uh, our food program, which we've been delivering meals weekly to seniors and uh, to, to children uh, via some of our recreation and senior center. So to date, I think we're going to eclipse 50,000 meals that have been handed out to seniors and children since about March 20th when the kind of the stay home order commenced. So we've been able to shift gears and even though we're not programming these physical spaces, um, we have been trying to serve the community in the best way that we can. Thanks, Ross. And I, I just want to thank Ross again for um, and his staff for all their amazing work, um, you know, during this COVID-19 stuff. Um, I, I just feel that his team has kind of moved heaven and earth um, to get meals into um, those that are less fortunate. And I think what they the work that they've done in this crisis is um, commendable and just absolutely amazing. So thanks again, Ross, and to you and all your team um, for what you do every single day. Thanks, Chris, I appreciate that. Yeah, they work hard. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we can, cons our considerations for project prioritization. Um, and we share these with um, the Office of Management and Budget and the, um, those folks that form the um, Capital Program Review Committee. Um, we, our, our first, if our first, First priorities are serving the community and our program needs. And so as Ross has alluded to, we interface very much and we very much value and respect their opinions um, on what they need and what their programs need in order to um, be successful. Um, and that includes whether or not an asset is like, is really right for what we're trying to deliver. Um, we also consider how an asset fits into the city's comprehensive plan. So if you participated in, in a uh, neighborhood planning project or any one of the uh, parks, city parks um, planning exercises that the Department of City Planning would run, um, you know, we take those, those considerations uh, very strongly to heart. And we do our best to honor um, those commitments that we put forth. We also consider the condition of the asset. If it's a building, what kind of condition is it in? How close is it? Um, the roof to the end of its useful life cycle. Um, how many more years does the HVAC equipment have left in it? Um, we also consider access to additional funding sources. So, um, you know, we talked briefly about, Dave talked briefly um, in the beginning about, you know, the different types of capital funds, whether we have bond, um, our community development block grant, but the, the city also receives grants from a variety of state agencies and in some cases, federal agencies. I and mean, then these are all critical for us trying to deliver great projects to, to our citizens. And then also um, we consider the cost and the type of project. So we try to work on in the Department of Public Works to figure out, you know, is this, do we have to do all of this work at once or can we some way um, phase this in um, so that we can get more accomplished in any given year? 
And with that, I am going to hand this over to Kara Smith from the Department of City Planning. So Kara, if you would uh, join us. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks Chris um, and thanks Ross and everybody. Uh, my name is Kara Smith. I'm a principal environmental planner in the Department of City Planning. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about uh, some of the past projects um, funded by the capital budget that city planning does or has done um, related to parks and open space. So I'll start with um, open space PGH, which was a plan. Um, it's a component of our comprehensive plan, the city's comprehensive plan adopted in 2013. Um, for a number of years, uh, not much planning was done in the city, you know, with the economic uh, downturn. But uh, this plan was sort of a way to kickstart or rethink um, where we were at with our open space system. And it made a lot of uh, recommendations for future open space planning, which I will talk about on future slides. Next. So these are two of the projects uh, that were recommendations of open space PGH. Uh, the vacant lot toolkit and policy guide was completed in 2015. And from that, um, our ordinance was changed and the adopt a lot program was established uh, to allow people to uh, have productive use of vacant uh, land in their neighborhood. Allows them to grow food, flowers, or rain gardens. And that program is run by Shelly Danko Day in our Sustainability and Resilience uh, Office. And then the Greenways 2.0 uh, Resource Guide and Policy Guide were completed in 2017. Uh, that was uh, uh, another rethinking of our Greenways. Uh, probably most people are familiar with Greenways. Um, they're a little different in Pittsburgh than what other cities think of as Greenways. Uh, it's those areas like Hazelwood Greenway and Seldom Seen that were generally um, steep, undevelopable land. Um, but through this guide, we recognize that um, that land still has a lot of value for uh, natural resources and recreation. So this plan is for that. Next slide. And um, one of the bigger things um, that provided direction for our planning work and in the open space system was just the various recommendations that were made for each individual park and green space. Uh, open space PGH uh, made recommendations to invest or redevelop, relocate, expand, naturalize, or divest um, according on all kinds of assessments and community input. And some of these parks um, for which it recommended investment or redevelopment or relocation, expansion, uh, sort of needed to be rethought. And so um, we have started to do and, and have a lot more work to do uh, with park master planning. And so what is a park master plan? Um, a park master plan is sort of like a community visioning process to assess um, a park's existing assets and facilities and, and also um, what issues it has and what opportunities there are. And as a way to sort of coalesce um, the neighborhood and surrounding uh, potential users to figure out what they would like to see in that park and then how to make it happen. So actually, um, Chris, if you could go to the next slide. We have a good example here for Southside Park. Um, Southside Park was completed in 2018 and um, it's in Southside Slopes. Hopefully you know about it. A, a lot of people um, in the area did not know about it even though it's a large um, community scale park uh, pretty much just because it was it's in kind of bad shape. Um, and so on the top left, you can see, I mean, you don't necessarily have to read all that, but it's an example of what a master plan uh, can look like when it's complete and it calls out various um, amenities and, and proposed changes. Um, there's a rendering on the bottom left that shows a beautiful stormwater wetland and boardwalk, which is part of phase one 
um, that DPW is working on the design of now. So phasing um, and cost estimates for each phase is an important part of a master plan because it helps you break down all of the great big ideas that a neighborhood has for a park into actual buildable chunks. Um, and and having, having that cost estimate and that plan in place really helps to get further grant funding uh, and to help, to help make things actually implementable. Uh, sorry, can you go back a slide now? Thank you. So yeah, we did uh, Southside Park master plan and have now shifted that work to the DPW implementation phase. Um, the design being uh, uh, led by Andrea Ketzel, our amazing landscape architect. And uh, we also did Sheridan Park master plan, um, finished up last fall. We have a number of upcoming park master plans too. Um, Emerald View Park Master Plan is one that I'm going to be leading that we're actually starting now. And um, that's on top of Mount Washington. It's now a regional park, so a lot of rethinking to do there. Uh, Westinghouse and Fort Pitt um, should be coming up in a, hopefully a couple of months. And then Hill District Park Master Plan and Hayes Woods will be after that. So we have a number of things in our queue. Uh, next. And you can go to the next one too. And um, these are not as directly, uh, oops, back one. These are not as directly parks and rec related, but I just wanted to point out that um, some of the other planning work that uh, Department of City Planning does also has or can have impact on uh, park and open space um, recommendations um, through our neighborhood planning. Um, we look at different topics such as parks and open space, tree canopy, uh, landscape, stormwater management, and so we can kind of influence um, the development of, of parks and open space that way too. There's an example of uh, Uptown Eco Innovation District plan here. That was one of our first ones. And since then we've done um, Homewood and Manchester, and we're working on Oakland now. Um, so, so those are also um, ways to influence influence parks and open space. And then um, the Climate Action Plan and uh, one PGH Resilience Plan, while they were not funded by the capital budget, they are um, representative of the type of work that we do and would like to continue doing to to help think about those bigger issues and help guide um, parks and, and other efforts throughout the city towards um, sustainability and equity and those kinds of bigger picture topics. So that's all I have to say for planning. Thanks, Kara. Mm -hmm. I wanna talk a little bit now about a brief smattering of projects to just kind of highlight um, you know, some of the changes that we've done or are gonna be happening um, very recently. Um, you know, this is, we're, we're going to talk about five projects of the, you know, 100, roughly 140 that my staff has on their plate right at the moment. So it is very, um, very small sample size, but I think these are kind of, you know, illustrative of what we, what we try to do and what we try to accomplish. So the, you know, we, we performed a lot of work recently in the last couple, last couple of years at the, um, what's known as the McGee Rec Center and the Greenfield Healthy Active Living Center. And this is in um, Greenfield neighborhood. Um, you know, when we initially developed the scope of work, it was, it probably took, it took us about three months. And we, we usually do those in-house um, with, in, with our in-house staff and public works. Um, there was a design phase. Um, so we did hire a contractor to kind of design and engineer a new um, air conditioning because previously the building had, had none and it got quite hot in the summer. Um, and it has a gymnasium with seniors in it. So we were just trying to bring some comfort. Um, and then we did some other additional things as well. So the whole construction here took about 18 months. It's what we would call multi-phase delivery, delivery is what I spoke about before. Um, so we did put air conditioning in the building to make it more habitable. Um, we did have improved aesthetics in the building. Um, we also provide a new playground and an improved ball field um, with new ball field lighting in the park 
adjacent to the rec center as well. And you can see kind of the transformation that we did on the exterior as part of that, where we put a new face on it, kind of dramatically um, changed the appearance of the, of the facility from the street. Um, I also want to point out too, that we did receive a Department of Aging grant, small grant that helped us facilitate the senior area classroom as English as a second, second language. Um, and so these are the types of things that we, we think about and we're trying to accomplish in our partnerships with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, we have a, an upcoming project at the uh, Sheridan um, Healthy Active Living Center. So again, this was another scope of work that we developed in-house. And we actually, the design you see here was done by um, my very talented team. This is a, this is a computer program called SketchUp, on that model that was developed by one of my staff members, Mr. Harvey Butts, in conjunction with some of my other team members, our senior architect, Kaz Pellegrini, and our associate project manager, Joe Diotori Jr. Um, and those folks kind of designed a new ADA accessible entrance to the facility. And also this, this pergola that you can see so that the seniors may have some type of a outdoor space. Um, this addresses kind of a longstanding um, accessibility issue into the facility for seniors. Um, it improves our aesthetics and then you know, we have made some recent smaller improvements in the facility that provide a little bit of comfort. We've renovated a bathroom um, for the seniors um, to provide a little bit more privacy, um, as well as we've just done some simple improvements to, to flooring um, to kind of improve, improve the experience. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, this is a rather large project, one of our largest um, parks development projects to date. This is in Whiteman Park. Um, we developed this scope of in-house um, that, again, that took us a couple months to do. Um, we did have a longer design phase. Um, and when, when you see the development, you'll understand why. This is currently under construction. Um, and it's taken us about 15 months. Um, and it's about a $3.7, $4 million construction project um, that we did in a, in a single phase. And you know, a lot of the focus was on, um, here was on stormwater management. Um, providing a new playground, a new picnic pavilion, as well as, um, you know, accessible restrooms. And we, you know, we've improved uh, fields and courts. This was a site of a school annex, uh, which, which we demolished as part of the project. Um, so this is a really wonderful example, I think, of um, a project transformation um, in a neighborhood park that's in, uh, you know, the middle of, middle of a community. Um, and so I think when, when this is completed, we're very excited about this because we think it's just a wonderful addition, wonderful transformation for the neighborhood. Uh, another project that we recently completed in 2019, this was the Paulson Spray Park. So again, we developed the scope in-house. This takes us a couple months. Um, we had a 12 month design phase. Um, we did all of our construction as a single phase here. The total delivery was about, um, one and a half million dollars, but it included not only um, the spray features that you see pictured here, but included the, the public art. We have a um, very wonderful public arts program here at the city that kind of enables us to engage local artists to design, and then we um, we, we work with them to create that design. Um, in this case, you see this is a mural on the pavement that looks like like the sea. Uh, we also renovated this bathhouse to make it more ADA accessible. And get new fixtures, and then we and we also made some um, improvements to the playing field adjacent to this spray park, as well as the um, as well as provided a new playground. Um, last, not least, um, we recently completed a um, total what I would call renovation of the Shenley Ice Rink skating rink in Shenley Park. Um, this design took us about 12 months, but we did, there was a lot of engineering um, that had to happen here to figure out exactly how we were going to deliver on this program. Construction itself took about six months um, and cost of 1.6 million. Um, but this, these improvements allowed us to provide ADA accessibility directly. So those folks that um, may be mobility challenged now have a direct accessible route and way to get onto the ice surface. Um, we've improved the aesthetics and we've greatly improved like the rink surface, the quality and its performance. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of our proposals as well that we were gonna put forth um, for 2021. Um, one of the things that we're striving to improve in the Department of Public Works is just being 
um, responsive to new situations and, and changing. I mean, I, we're all experiencing the effects of COVID-19. Um, so one of the pro pro programs that we're going to put forth to the capital budget this year is going to be a multi-year, multi-deliverable program that addresses public restrooms and all city facilities. So we would do this via, you know, cleanliness and sanitation, uh, no touch and low flow fixtures, uh, as well as providing an emphasis on ADA accessibility. There are some things that, um, issues like fresh air exchange that are also important. So we generally capture those as part of like a larger facility renovation. With that, um, we are done with our slides. So, so I was gonna um, hand it off to um, Dave Hutchinson. Thank you much, Chris. I'm gonna try to share my screen if you can turn yours off. There we go. So at this time, um, you have the opportunity to ask questions of the people you just heard from. We have a lot of great expertise in the room. Um, again, all comments and questions that are in the chat are gonna be recorded and sent to council members in the mayor's office. I'm gonna read questions uh, for the panel aloud and ask the appropriate panel member to respond. If you are joining by phone though, or, or prefer to ask your question aloud, please unmute yourself when we ask for questions from callers. And again, this meeting is gonna be recorded and posted to the city channel YouTube. Um, at youtube.com backslash city channel Pittsburgh. So I just want to start by taking a minute or two to see if there are any callers who want to unmute and ask a question. Okay, it looks like everybody is a Zoom attendee through the app. Um, so our first question, let me bring my chat back up. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. All right. Hannah asked, how can we access the recordings of the previous two sessions? Um, Leah answered it in the chat, but for those that didn't see, you can check out again that YouTube um, page for the City Channel of Pittsburgh. I do recommend subscribing to it. I'm a subscriber as well. There's some other kind of great videos that come up. Um, City Council proceedings are a great thing to watch on YouTube. It's a great way to stay kind of plugged into what's happening in the city. You get to hear a lot of perspectives from your council member. Um, and, and kind of how they want to operate within the city. It's also just good TV, to be honest with you. Sometimes they, they give reality TV a run for their money. There's um, a question from Chris. What's the status of the parks tax? When will the city start collecting it? My understanding of that is it's still, they're still working out the agreement that's, that needs to be in place between the city of Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. Um, any spending of that $10 million a year from the parks tax would have to go through city council for approval, similar to anything that's in the capital budget. Um, but they still want to just have that agreement in place to understand kind of everybody's roles and responsibilities. Um, I'm not the most up to date on it, but I think it kind of took a back seat with all the, all the response we needed to do with um, COVID-19. Chris asked, um, how can I get more involved in, in city parks tennis? I think this is a great question for Ross to answer. Uh, thanks, Dave. Yeah, sorry, it took me a second to unmute there. Um, you can contact us directly. Uh, we have a, so we operate, obviously, the Mellon Tennis Facility, uh, which is also reopening at a kind of a reduced occupancy uh, in response to COVID, of course, but we are reopening it. Planned reopen, it, reopening is this Monday on June 15th. You can stop in to that location and inquire about um, how to get involved. We operate programs during normal summer summer seasons uh, at uh, the courts at Shen Lane. There's a pretty robust program out of Highland Park. Uh, we also uh, work in conjunction with the Frick Park Tennis Association uh, to manage and operate programs at the Frick uh, Park Clay Courts. So uh, if you want to get involved from a um, kind of a patron user standpoint, you can contact us if you're interested in, in how, to, how to be involved and perhaps help deliver a clinic or something, please reach out to us and all the contact information is on our website. Uh, so feel free to do that. Excellent. Chris also gave us some notes um, on the status of some of the city's tennis courts. Again, we're going to share your, your notes back to, to um, DPW at the end of this meeting so they have a chance to investigate, maybe put together a proposal if need be. Um, Robert Cavalier, hey Robert, I hope you heard the, the shout out earlier. Uh, Robert Cavalier asked who maintains the bike trails? Um, Chris might have a more detailed answer. My understanding is that if, the short answer, the short and sloppy answer is, if it's inside a park, it's DPW. If it's not, it's generally Domi. Um, Chris, do you have anything else to add to that? 
No, I think that's that's generally um, that's generally the way it works. Um, like large scale, um, like large scale improvement in a park, we would ask Domi to kind of lead and provide their expertise in that because they are um, you know the mobility expert. But like the regular um, recurring maintenance of those bike trails, that Public Works would perform that. Okay. Mark asks a good question. Fraser Fieldhouse in South Oakland, more or less part of the Dan Marino Field, could use some serious work, perhaps sustainment or transformation. It is essentially a concrete block shed, probably not a full-fledged community center, but expanded space, better storage, modern bathrooms with running water, multiple rooms would be great. Not sure if softball leagues that use the field could get some kind of storage, other amenities not currently available or possible. Any existing thoughts, plans, advice for doing something like that? Um, Chris, I'll give you the opportunity if you want to talk specifically about that project, but I think it'd also be interesting to hear how um, with city planning and kind of the development of uh, Park Master Plan, how those kind of community inputs are included in the process itself. Sure, absolutely, Dave. Um, you know, for that specific asset, I am familiar with that. We have had discussions um, with some community folks around providing a covered um, pavilion uh, near the building to, um, uh, we understand that a lot of youth hang out, that's a popular bus stop location. Um, and so that's something that we're certainly um, contemplating. Um, you know, I am aware of some of the issues in those buildings. Um, so I'm happy to kind of talk a little bit more to take this, take your thoughts on that. You know, we would also ask um, city planning, so I'm gonna ask Kara Smith to to step in because we would check with them to see, um, you know, where that particular park and what it sits and in, in its process of, of city planning as well. Sure. So actually, um, because we are working on the Oakland neighborhood plan now, and right now we're just working with the steering committee, but um, soon we will be getting into the action teams. There's four action teams as part of neighborhood plans um, for our neighborhood plan guide recently adopted. Um, the infrastructure action team is the one that deals with parks and open space, as well as other things like stormwater, trees, even uh, digital infrastructure. Anyway, um, we will be having definitely a neighborhood-wide uh, conversation about parks and open space in Oakland. Uh, we know that well, while you have a great asset in Shenley Park, um, the neighborhood parks themselves are sort of lacking or there's not, there's not really enough um, and may not meet the community's needs. So I would encourage you to get involved in that uh, infrastructure action team um, and check out the website and follow that. Um, we recently had some consultants do a great assessment of all of the, uh, the park resources in Oakland. So yeah, we'll definitely be talking more about that. Yeah, we followed a similar model with um, Homewood. We are undertaking, we're in the very early stages right now of a transformation project that DPW is running for uh, Willie Stargell Field, Homewood Park. And so one of the great things about that was we had just done, our city planning had just done the neighborhood planning for Homewood, Park, for, for Homewood the neighborhood, uh, which included that, that kind of subgroup that Kara's describing um, around that recreation asset. We were able to get some information already from the public. So it was really useful for for Chris's team in developing the scope to have that um, neighborhood planning information available. Stephanie um, noted that it would be great to see more coordination between PW, um, I'm assuming Public Works, PWSA, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, and PPC, or Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, on park projects. In Highland Park, all three have a big presence, but they do not always seem to communicate or have coordinated planning process. Um, Chris, do you wanna talk about any of the, the projects kind of happening right now? around Highland Park. I know we have the RAD project that we're um, gonna be getting into design soon for the um, Super Playground. I know that the city also coordinated with PPC and Bike Pittsburgh on the, the basically the, the no car street policy that was just announced, I believe today, not yesterday, um, that I'm personally pretty excited about. But um, Chris, if there's anything you wanted to add about Highland Park? Yeah, absolutely, Dave. Thanks. Um, you know, I I would challenge that. It, it might it might necessarily appear that way, but um, we do actually regularly coordinate with um, the Parks Conservancy and especially PWSA. We we meet biweekly um, to discuss ongoing projects with PWSA. 
um, as well as to discuss uh, planning opportunities. So um, in the pilot, in the Highland Park area, um, you know, just as an example, the city will have had budgeted um, some other improvements to the Highland Park pedestrian tunnel. Um, and we have, you know, reached out to PWSA for input and guidance um, because of the reservoir and some, you know, existing water and drainage issues that we know to exist. In turn, um, PWSA has, you know, I think coordinated with us very well on, um, you know, some water improvement infrastructure that they need that impacts the park. Um, and so we've helped to work with them to kind of, you know, improve some assets. What you should see is improve some assets in the area in terms of walkways, um, in terms of actually having cleaner, more efficient water delivery in that part of the city. Um, so it's not always trumpeted or it doesn't necessarily always appear that way, but we do, we do coordinate fairly often. Yeah, actually the current budget director, I think is Jen's title of, of PWSA used to hold this position actually, um, the Office of Management and Budget. So at least we, have, we, have, we definitely have somebody over there who knows how to do the city side of things too. Um, Ross just had a question on when spray parks will be open. Yeah, <clears throat> again, hats off to Chris and the, the whole of the public works team, as well as uh, the aquatics, my aquatics program staff, um, June, uh, June, yes, June 15th. So uh, with the announcement, I think there was a press release just on Monday, uh, the mayor announced uh, some additional um, kind of green lit recreational activities that are now gonna come online. So in addition to, um, some field permitting that'll go on and some kind of open space um, program activation um, that will soon start uh, the 15th or soon thereafter. Uh, Chris's team um, has been working pretty hard to get the spray parks and spray features. Uh, there's a little distinction between them that I could point to the pulse and slide, um, pulse and spray park slide that uh, Chris showed earlier, which showed that kind of colorful spray pad and all of those spray features. That's kind of, what we typically refer to uh, as more of a spray park. Usually we'll have an attendant person kind of in and out of that space, uh, more or less to make sure things are moving or working pretty well and the public is engaged in the way that they, uh, I guess, should be in that, in that space. Um, they can get pretty busy. But uh, Chris's team has been working really hard this past week and a half to prepare these facilities for a start on the 15th on the 15th. So that's, a, that's the plan. Excuse me. Excellent. Chris had a question. If a private company wants to provide additional funding in exchange for advertising in a city park, will that move a project up the priority list? Um, Chris, I don't know if you know anything about licensing in that sense. Um, I will say if you ever hear anybody referencing MBRO or market-based revenue opportunities, that's kind of how government people talk about things. Um, instead of saying advertising, that's the fancy language they like to use. Um, but I'm not, I don't know what our, if we have a standing policy on that. I don't believe that we have a standing policy on that. I mean, we sometimes do um, receive private funding, um, but not in exchange for advertising. Um, I, I would honestly, I'd have to check with the um, director, Mike Gable, on, on what his um, opinion of that is. Catherine um, noted that several Polish Hill residents and I have started a community garden at West Penn Park in Polish Hill. We are working with Deb Gross to build up our garden and grow food to address food insecurity due to the pandemic and systemic inequality. I'm wondering if you, if you all are planning to invest DPW dollars in the City Farms program. If so, how do you plan on doing this and when? This would help us better our uh, public park and allow us and other city residents to provide free access to nutritional food for Pittsburghers. Um, Chris, if you just want to talk about kind of the, some of the initiatives we have going on in the parks um, now with how we're growing things. And then if you have any ideas about the community gardens, I know in the open space plan that Kara was referencing earlier from 2013 that we use all the time, um, gardening scored really high as a recreational um, activity. A lot of people really enjoy gardening, myself included. Yes, absolutely. Um... So the gardening program itself is run out of the Department of Public Works that's actually administered by Assistant Director Marcel Newman and some of her staff. But what I can, what I can share with you would be to reach out to um, her directly. Um, we do lots of little mini improvements. We would love to help um, in this case. 
Um, you know, we were very proud of our community gardening program, whether it be in a park or whether it be in some of our vacant lots that we kind of help administer. So um, if there's a way that we can find to, you know, invest some dollars into this farm program, we'd be happy to do it. Excellent. I think that's still, is that's, I believe it's still being worked out, like the planning part is still kind of being worked out through council, if I'm up to date on my, on my account. Um, there was a, there's two questions but I'm definitely going to get to, but there was um, a follow-up question related to community gardens. So just while we're on the same topic, there was a question, um, there's a PWSA water source near our garden we would like to have access to. How do we get access to this water? Who can I talk to? Um, my first recommendation would be to reach out to PWSA to see kind of what their policy is on, on accessing those things. Um, we've been involved in a few community garden kind of water turn-ons, but usually the city is the owner of the land. Um, if that's the case here, you can just kind of let us know um, through an email or in, or in the chat, or you can fill out a survey, capital budget survey for 2021, and I'll plug that again, um, and let us know what your specific site is, and we can do some more research and figure out if there's an opportunity for the city to pitch in on that. There was a question um, from Andrea, how can we justify the expenditure of a new police facility? Um, Chris, do you want to talk about the existing lease that we're in for police headquarters and some of the kind of program considerations as well? Absolutely, Dave. So, you know, everybody should be aware that, you know, our current police headquarters and our current police um, training academy are located, are actually owned by um, private entity. And we, you know, have a lease for them that runs um, roughly $1.5 million annually for those facilities. Um, and that relates to police headquarters. So in terms of a consideration, we always feel like, um, you know, the Department of Public Works' perspective is if we are to have a police force uh, that ought to have a headquarters and that the city ought to own that facility. So it is kind of our preference to um, have ownership, complete ownership and control for, um, we feel like that is, you know, the best, most appropriate way to deliver that type of function to the community. I think there are also um, some other um, police capital projects um, that are also beneficial and help to be justified. I'll point to um, a previously funded capital project to relocate a zone five off of Washington Boulevard and into uh, Fire Station 8, which is in East Liberty. And that is actually the, the large building in East Liberty was actually the former location of um, the police zone that was moved many years ago. Um, and this would actually allow us to, the, to address a couple things. Currently, um, the police zone five building as it exists on Washington Boulevard is in a really poor shape. Um, you know, the heating and air conditioning struggles to work. Um, it exists in a floodplain and um, it has numerous other issues that we have to deal with as well regarding, um, you know, communications and electricity that just make it a problematic facility altogether. Um, this renovation project um, would vacate that property and the, the plan of which is to, um, you know, demolish that building and to, and to use that site as to mitigate stormwater as it's related to the flood zone. Um, the other piece of it is in the existing um, fire station eight, which is located in East Liberty, which is where police zone five is planned to relocate. We would do a deep, what we would call a deep retrofit of that building um, to make it net zero ready. Uh, basically net zero ready just means that, you know, it uses the minimal amount of electricity, water, and um, other natural resources to heat and cool the building and provide, um, you know, fresh hot and cold water to occupants. Um, we feel like that's a justifiable program just based on the history of um, Washington Boulevard and the flooding that's occurred there. Um, as well as, you know, demonstrating that the city can develop and have um, low energy, low intensity buildings um, that last a lifetime and are, are um, healthier for all of our occupants and the public as a whole. We had a, um, yeah. sorry, sorry. Need some feedback there. Um, we had a question, I'm sorry, Where are we? getting lost here. 
There we go. Stephanie asked, will we have a chance to testify tonight? Um, tonight's a great opportunity if you have any questions for the four people on the screen uh, from City Parks, DPW, or City Plain that you want to pose to about um, anything in the capital budget, you're welcome to type it out here. If you want to ask it yourself, I'm going to open things back up to anybody on the phone or anybody who wants to ask their own question um, in just a little bit. If you have just a general comment or something that you want anybody in city government to really know, feel free to type that in, even if it doesn't feel related to capital budgets. I will make sure that it gets to the, the right parties. Um, we've had years in the past where people came out. We had, I think it was, I don't know, the 17? I forget which year it was. It was one year we were having a capital budget meeting um, while there were a lot of news stories about the city's Amazon proposal. I, I treated those responses like I would treat a capital budget response. I tagged it. I made sure that the, the people who need that information um, got a chance to see all the comments directly afterwards. And we're going to demonstrate that in just a, a couple slides when we wrap up questions. So up next. Um, Another comment from Andrea, thank you. Um, Stephanie asks, when the new public safety center goes online, will the existing shooting range be closed? Shooting can regularly be heard in Highland Park, the park and the neighborhood, which neighbors find quite disturbing. We've been told that the range would be closed when the new center is open. Chris, do you wanna talk about kind of scope development in that sense? Yeah, I can. And I, and I want to be clear that for the public safety um, training center that, the, you know, the, the scope is far from set in stone. This is certainly, um, you know, a topic that the public Department of Public Safety has raised as, you know, if it's an opportunity that we can provide, um, we should try to do that. I can also say that, um, you know, a shooting range in and of itself presents many challenges to development um, to make sure that we're keeping both the users of that shooting range and the general public um, safe during its operations. Um, you know, we would consult with our federal partners as well as our state partners in, in doing a thorough design if it was to be relocated. Um, so it's not something that could, that's easily relocated and, and moved. I think also, I want to bring up or take the opportunity to discuss that as it relates to the existing shooting range, and because we do know that it is a problem that can be heard from um, the residents in Highland Park. Uh, we are, we do have a project that's going to address uh, stormwater as part of um, work on the firing range. This is a cap, this is a, a capital project that was approved in um, 2019. And Part of that project is to do some noise mitigation. Um, what we, what we, I don't know the particular details of that noise mitigation yet. It certainly is not gonna be like a noise reduction. I don't wanna give that impression, um, but hopefully it does help to kind of mitigate some of that, um, that impact. Thank you. So at this time, I wanna open it back up to anybody who's joined via telephone or who wants to um, ask their question aloud. I'm just going to leave some silence here. Feel free to unmute. All right. Thank you. Those are some, some good questions. So this is not the end all be all. You have, a, a, like Chris said, you have a bunch of other opportunities to chime in on specific capital projects or the capital capital budget as a whole. Um, tonight, we're asking that if you can go in and complete the 2021 capital budget survey. It provides a lot of really important information for the city to react to and plan with. So this is an example of last year's form when we were using paper forms. Um, I went in and reviewed each of the responses that we got. I tagged them with geographic tags, with department tags, with project type tags. And then I created um, a user guide of sorts that would list all of the individual tags and the page numbers. So if you were um, Ross and you wanted to see all the notes on Rec and Senior Centers, you'd have the opportunity to look at you know, pages seven and 14 and 26. Um, in some cases, we actually, like this is a great example. Um, there's, there's some really good harmony between the comments that we're getting in the, in the capital budget surveys and also what ends up in the capital budget. Again, we score against um, a category called demonstrated public support. So having notes, um, positive or negative 
on specific capital projects from things like the capital budget survey factors into the ways in which the capital program facilitation committee scores projects. This year we went digital. It's a Google form. It's pretty short. It should take you about five minutes or less. Just a, a basic piece of de demographic information with your neighborhood. Um, you have the opportunity to tell us that, hey, this tennis court needs to be addressed. It's got some cracks. Um, you also have the opportunity to review each of the mayor's 10 capital budget priorities in full. You can get the full text on the survey and you can rank them. You can let us know how you feel if they're important or not important to you. We also just wanted to take a look at last year's survey results there on the right hand side, this pie graph. Um, they're kind of grouped by the six categories that we have in the capital budget itself. These are just kind of the big buckets um, that we put projects into. Um, this is the survey responses in terms of the specific projects that people wanted to see happening. And on the left hand side is the actual spending in the 2020 budget. Um, they, don't, they don't align perfectly. Unfortunately, not a lot of people care much about vehicles and equipment, which is understandable. It's not the most fun thing to advocate for. Um, but I think there's, there's pretty decent alignment in terms of how the public wants the budget to go and how we're, we're trying to put it together. Again, this is not your last opportunity for public input. So I wanted to highlight really three of these tools that I think are, are pretty useful. Um, of course, you, you can always chat with 311 if you have a specific concern about a specific asset. Um, you can check out more documents on the city council budget office page. Um, you can email our team at CIP at PittsburghPA.gov. Also, please feel free to reach out to your council office. There are some amazing advocates for you out there that are working behind the scenes, giving us a lot of grief um, to get our jobs done, which is the way it's supposed to work. So please lean on your council office. That's what they're there for. Um, and then we're going to go through three tools online right now. So one is going to be Berg's Eye View, which is a really cool data layer or series of data layers. Let's see if there's a refresh for me. Um, with a bunch of citywide reported data, right? So there's 311 requests, there's police information. If you scroll down a little bit further, they're in this really light purple, lavender we'll say, um, there's a capital, capital projects layer. With this, you can drill down to your neighborhood. Um, you can kind of see what's going on in terms of the capital projects that are in progress. Um, it'll tell you the project type and the location, the budget for it, which, which capital budget year it was in, if you wanted to go look up the budget, um, and then also the status of it. And so you may end up seeing projects that were in the budget that you're driving by it every day, you're not seeing any changes, and you, you feel like we're not getting anything done. As Chris and Kara noted, we could be doing a lot of work behind the scenes on planning and design. Um, so even if you don't see shovels in the ground quite yet, sometimes that's one of the shorter phases of the project. So we may be doing a lot of work kind of behind the scenes to get ready for those things. Additionally, uh, let me try to get up here, sorry. Let's see if this works. If you wanted to look up any of our budgets, um, we're just in the city's website. We're just under the city hall banner, office of management and budget. Um, and there's a budgets and reports tab. So you can check out both the capital and operating budgets in here. If you wanted to kind of try your own hand, at making your own capital budget. There's a couple tools that I wanna highlight with our Vendor Balancing Act. One is, I think is really cool, is a, is a tax receipt that allows you to put in what your income is or the value of any of your property. And you kind of get an itemized estimated receipt of sorts on where your dollars that you contribute to the city in taxes, where they're going, how they're distributed. Um, this includes both the operating budget, so things like salaries and benefits, but also there's capital projects down towards the bottom as well. So you can see some of those um, down here, with bridge repairs, things like that. At the bottom of the tax receipt, there's two budget simulations. Um, we're gonna go to capital. And this is where you can, you, can, you can try doing our job. It's a lot of fun. You have the opportunity um, to change how projects are funded. So if you really wanna increase spending for affordable housing, that's really important to you. You have the opportunity to do that. Keep in mind, you have to balance your budget though. It, it literally will not let you submit until you're back to zero or you have a positive um, operating result as we call it in government. There are also some, some scenarios that come up from time to time or some specific projects that we wanted to shed some light on so people have a better sense of what happens when we're making these decisions, right? So in this opportunity, there's pools, uh, um, spray parks. We said, what would it take to build a new spray park? 
that would effectively add a million dollars. That's roughly the cost of a new spray park. And then you have to kind of deal with that on the revenue side or decrease the budget for another project to make sure that you stay balanced. Each one of these also allows the opportunity to comment. So if you say, um, I want a new spray park in Carrick. When you submit um, your overall budget, we get both sets of data. We get all of the numerical changes that you've made to the budget itself. So we have a sense of kind of what you want to see moved up and down. And we also get any of your comments. So when this is submitted, uh, we get comments that way as well. That's um, pretty much the extent of what we had for tonight. So I wanted to again thank our interpreters, Logan and Megan, thank you so much. Also to Bill and Joy for uh, making this happen for us. Keep an eye out on, on YouTube for when this, this video will be uploaded. Um, give them a few days, they're in very high demand right now. They have a very important skill set uh, working digitally right now, so they've got a lot to do. But I also wanna say thank you to everybody that attended, everybody that's watching on YouTube or watching on a replay. Um, there's a lot of really important things going on tonight and I, uh, in the world right now, and I appreciate everybody taking time to talk about capital. Thank you much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.